Welcome to Chill Skills Sporland Tech Talks. It's showtime. Thank you for joining us today. The topic for this episode is defrost. Defrost methods are how to thaw out your refrigerator freezer and not use an ice pick. This is the continuation of a series of presentations that has been following the agenda of the old supermarket seminars. In the past, Sporland had a team of professionals on a supermarket team. They went around the country to facilitate these presentations in person. With this tech talk entry, we're bringing the concept of the supermarket seminar back to you directly and servicing a bigger audience in the process. At least that's the intention. Again, thank you to all that have joined us. We appreciate you hanging in there with us. Here's a shameless promotion for the next webinar on April the 22nd. Yeah, we're back to the once a month routine. We'll present how to break and barbecue your compressor without really trying. Kind of sounds like a new cooking show, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, that's- You, you got uh, something to say about that? Uh, that looks like more than a barbecue to me. I actually, I actually uh, uh, heard that this photo came from the US military. This was an Al Qaeda compressor that was uh, attacked by an elite Navy SEAL unit. But I, that could be all rumor, yeah, I'm not sure. I think you're making it up. Uh, me? Never. Here are a few instructions. If the speaker on your computer doesn't work, you can simply dial in with your phone. Here's a number that you can use, making it mm -hmm. handy for you. As we move along and you have questions, you can type those questions into the Q&A window and we plan to answer some questions live. Indeed. Now, uh, if we run out of time to answer all the questions during the webinar, we will eventually post answers to all your questions online. However, if you hang on, there's a good bet that we may answer your questions question during the course of the webinar itself. And just so you know, we oftentimes get asked this question, um, where can I access this later? Do you record it? Yes, we record every single one of these. You can go back and watch it on Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel. And in fact, you can watch all of our previous webinars in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Sporlin is always here to assist you with your air conditioning and ref refrigeration flow control needs, you can reach us by calling the general number for headquarters. That's this number right here, 636-239-1111. Or you can call our technical support, and that's technical support for our products. And that's 636-392-3906. Or you can always shoot an email out to support at parker.com. And of course, we're here 24-7 at www.sporland.com. Correct. Hello, I'm Jim Jansen, Senior Application Engineer for the Sporland Application Team. That's me on the left. That's this guy. And, and I guess this made a whole lot more sense when we weren't broadcasting a video. And joining me today is John Whithouse. That's this guy over here. John is the Senior Principal Engineer for the Sporland Division. He's a published author, consultant, and as I've said in the past, he's an all-around extra smart guy. Now, all this means John's a big deal around here, and I'm really happy to have him with us. Say hi, John. Good afternoon, Jim, and good afternoon to everyone out there. Phyllis is in the room. She's our communications director. She handles all of the, most of all the background stuff that goes into putting these on. She gets the invitations out. Uh, she's assisted by Dennis, who does a lot of that kind of work. And then, of course, Jen helps us put these nice slides together. Refrigeration systems that operate with saturated suction temperatures that by design are 32 degrees F or less will sooner or later develop frost on the evaporator. Yeah, there's some exceptions to this. You know, if you've got an air conditioning system running at as low as maybe 26 degrees saturated suction mm -hmm. with adequate velocity across the evaporator, that may not develop any frost. Make sense, John? It does, it does. But at some point, frost will develop, and at some point, that will become detrimental to system performance and will need to be removed. Defrost types, while there exist many options for defrost, we plan to discuss three, off time, electric, and gas. Medium temp cases are typically designed for off temp, off time defrost, off time. I'm off temp, I think. Apparently, this really is the thing for medium temp applications. To initiate defrost, a defrost timer, defrost clock would start the process. A liquid line solenoid valve or 
or another positive closure device, maybe an EPR, a sort, or EEPR, a CDS, would stop the flow of refrigerant. The compressor may or may not be de-energized depending upon the system type. You know, if it's a conventional single evaporator, single compressor, maybe so. Then probably, probably would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A multiplex system, you probably have some compressors that continue to operate. Correct. Fans continue to move air across the evaporator coil. That's one of the important aspects of this. This air movement helps to melt the ice on the evaporator mm -hmm. coil surface. In other words, helps it to defrost. After the discharge air temperature meets the termination temperature set point, or the defrost uh, determination time has been satisfied, the system would restart. Mm -hmm. What's typical off time defrost cycles? John, how long would they last? Uh, they can last up to 45 minutes. Uh, you usually would last no less than 20 or 25 minutes, but up to 45 minutes. How many times would you do that a day? Well, that's going to depend on the configuration of the case okay. that you're defrosting. Um, some cases may only require a couple of defrosts per day. Others may require up to about six. Oh, so oh. once ever, as much as once every four hours. Okay, so here's the big question. How are the number of defrosts de determined? Well, that would actually be determined by the case manufacturer uh, through testing. And um, they would make suggestions and recommendations on a defrost schedule for the case. Okay, that makes sense. The off-time method of defrost is by far more prevalent than simply allowing the unit to cycle to an off condition and letting nature run its course. Mm -hmm need to maintain that the fans helps maintain the air curtain and help defrost the case at the same time. And here's a way to control it. You could use the Sporlin S3C case control with the valve module and the display. Just saying, that is a way to do it. That is Not the only it. way, but a way. Low temp cases operate at lower saturated suction temperatures. That's why they're low temp and have the potential to accumulate more frost, more ice over time on the evaporator surface as compared to medium temp applications. Off time defrost will likely not defrost the coil adequately within acceptable time constraints. Additional heat's gonna to need to be added to defrost the coil. Correct. You could use electric resistance heaters could be used for that purpose. Defrost is terminated when the evaporator coil temperature reaches a defrost termination set point. Mm -hmm. Are the defrost length reaches a maximum duration and is terminated based upon time? John, what kind of time are we talking about here? Uh, for, your low for your low temp cases, it uh, could be as short as 30 minutes, um, but up to 60 minutes is not unheard of at all, particularly for a closed type case. Yeah, that sounds like that's kind of close to an hour. Mm -hmm. Low temperature, close. low temperature cases are typically defrosted once or twice per day. Mm -hmm. Now those, what, open, low temp, multi-dex? Yep. You might need three times per day to get those to defrost. Yes, those are, uh, yeah, they're special cases. You're going to say energy pigs, weren't you? No, I wasn't. You were going to were gonna say that. Okay, I admit it, I wasn't okay. going to say that, but oh, I didn't. But overall... Can you, is this safe to say, John, electric defrost is simple, reliable, and effective? I think that's a fair assessment. If we refer to the slide here, mm -hmm. we do a short excursion here into the troubleshooting realm of things. Let's say the evaporator is not completely defrosting. What could contribute to that? Well, I'll tell you one of the single biggest problems you have in systems is the continued accumulation of frost. Mm -hmm. You've got to completely get that stuff off. Correct. Every defrost needs to completely defrost the evaporator. If there's any frost left really at all, um, you'll have a, uh, usually results in a condition of the evaporator continue, continuing to build that small amount of frost over time. It may happen over a couple of days or a couple of weeks or even a couple of months but it will result in a, um, a truly bunkered up coil. But that's not good. Not good. Okay. No airflow, no cooling, warm food, bad deal. <laughs> so if it wasn't previously defrosted correctly, what could, what could account for that? Uh, the refrigerant flow may have continued 
to occur, that would be Correct. a problem, That's right? That's a problem, yep. Uh, what if you had some electrical issue and you didn't have solenoid valves that were operating correctly or the controls weren't operating correctly? That could contribute that certainly to that. Do it. Yep. What kind of valve issue could we have? We'd have, like, like, I guess, like the solenoid valve might not be functioning like it's supposed to. If it was to. functioning incorrectly or uh, if you had some kind of leakage past or, yep. Uh, excessive seat leakage mm -hmm. in there. Electric heater malfunction. Yep. If, you, if you're trying to do electric resistance heat for defrost and the heater's not working. Correct. That's probably a problem. That is a problem. Ah. That is a problem. It could be the, uh, could be sometimes be the heater itself. Uh, that's much less likely, but um, those are typically fairly high wattage heaters. So electrical connections themselves can be, can come into play, can come into play. Yep. Makes sense. Let's talk about some of the types of gas defrost. Over here on the slide, you can see that one of them is a three pipe defrost. I've heard those are typically used for industrial applications. But typically industrial, sometimes com some certain commercial applications. But what the, Haiti, what is a three pipe system? What is that? Well, it's simply because there's a third pipe that's involved going out there. You don't have simply a liquid line and a suction line. You actually have uh, basically a defrost gas supply pipe that also goes out there. Um, so you get your hot gas out to the loads, there to the evaporators that need defrosting uh, quickly and efficiently. Uh, so that comes, that's not used during the normal refrigeration cycle. It comes into play only during defrost. You, you tell me there's a third pipe that runs between the compressor rack and the evaporators? That's what I'm telling you. And so hot gas is taken from the compressor discharged and introduced into the inlet evaporator, mm -hmm. but what would we be downstream of the TEV? Downstream of the TEV. Okay. Doesn't go through well through a TEV. Ah, well, you know what? We could maybe use one of those fancy side connection style distributors to accommodate the plumbing aspect of that. Would that make sense? Uh, you could certainly do that. Okay. Well, John, where would you see systems like that? A uh, three pipe system. Um, one thing that comes to mind is the uh, Hussman protocol units, uh, particularly when they're used for low temp applications. Uh, you know, that's the uh, distributed refrigeration system that's uh, been out on the market for a number of years now. Um, you know, they run several of the smaller uh, scroll compressors, Copeland scroll compressors uh, in parallel. So they're kind of a miniature parallel system, if you will. Um, and three pipe hot gas defrost is one of the, uh, is one of the chosen methods uh, for defrost with the protocol units. I see. That makes sense. And in that case, would we have an EPR out of the case or maybe no EPR at all in those kind of deals? Potentially, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Now there's reverse cycle defrost. It uses a four-way valve to switch the flow of the refrigerant cycle. This causes the evaporator to become the condenser for the defrost cycle. Correct. Sort of like a heat pump. It's very much like a heat pump. <laughs> a, a number of OEMs have used that reverse cycle. Uh, and those, then those typically work, those are typically going to be your smaller systems. Makes sense. So, makes sense. Uh, self contained and uh, single, you know, what we would consider a conventional or just single, single compressor, single evaporator type systems. Gotcha. Well, I tell you what, I think we're going to spend maybe a little more time talking about the reverse flow defrost method. Correct. And, and maybe uh, some time on this cool gas, which I think is a former Hussman patent. That was a system that was invented a number of years ago by Hussman. Gotcha. Now, following defrost termination, what happens? A TV opens, if you got a full column of liquid and the coil will pull down. And depending upon the infiltration and humidity levels, you might yep. see some surface frost develop really quickly. Yeah, you can see a light film frost. It's actually fascinating to watch. It's, uh, you might see that surface frost, uh, you know, film form, as you said, pretty much instantaneously. You know, some OEMs have used pressure termination with a suction pressure switch to stop the process. However, I'm told there's probably a more universal uh, way of doing that. What would that be? Time termination. Time? Yep, time termination. Now, 
I've also heard that pump down cycles in conjunction with a liquid line solenoid can be used to evacuate the evaporator prior to launching whatever defrost method you've selected to use. Correct. Now, is that a good idea? It's a very good idea, um, particularly if you're running a flooded evaporator system, which would typically be typical of a you know, large industrial application. Um, you don't want a bunch of liquid refrigerant laying there in that coil when you're trying to defrost it. So good that makes to, sense. Good to pull that out of there. That makes sense. In many supermarket applications, refrigerant from the discharge line or from the top of the receiver is used to defrost the evaporators. Mm -hmm. How is this done? I, so a portion of the refrigerant or the, you know, the hot gas, that hot discharge gas, yeah, that's, for me to say, yeah, hot gas, yeah. or the cooler gas from the top of the receiver is diverted to the suction line and basically backward through the evaporator. Uh, of course, that's one that you're trying to defrost at that time. So, so that so the refrigerant condenses then in the evaporator mm -hmm. and flows in reverse. Maybe have a check valve, go around the TV, around the TV. and the yep. solenoid valve, mm -hmm. and that heat transfer process that takes place defrosts the coil. Correct. So you over here you've got a defrost header and a liquid header, and you would have this defrost running this defrost gas running through the evaporator and then getting around the expansion valve and around the solenoid valve. And I can't really see that very well, John. So let's take a, let's take a closer look. There you go. Uh, for gas defrost to occur, the liquid line solenoid valve stops the flow of liquid. Mm -hmm. I guess that's why it's called a liquid line solenoid valve. Mm -hmm. And allows discharge gas to flow in reverse through the evaporator. And that's the evaporator that's being defrosted and then back to the liquid header. And along the way, the refrigerant condenses to a liquid and returns to the liquid header and can then be used by the other circuits for refrigeration. Or said another way, this refrigerant will be supplied to the evaporators that are not in the defrost cycle. Correct. Now, you probably also want to close off the EPR or the EEPR uh, to keep the discharge gas from entering the compressor suction line. Does that make sense? Yep. If we take a look at the slide Absolutely. over here, We've got the defrost header right here. Is that what that is, John, right there? That's is that, the defrost that's header. That's the defrost header. Yeah. And then here's, here's those solenoid valves we were talking about. And then you'd have the hot gas flowing backwards through the evaporator. And then these check valves would allow for the flow to bypass the expansion valve right. and the solenoid and then get back into the, the liquid header over here. That's a fairly good illustration of the side ported distributor there too at the bottom. Aha. Yes, indeed, right there. right there. You mentioned that earlier. But how can this reverse flow happen? I mean, usually flow is going in the other direction. So you, there has to be a differential pressure there. So for the, uh, the pressure in the defrost header must be held at a greater pressure um, than the uh, liquid header. Well, and that, and that difference, I've heard that difference called uh, the defrost differential. Does that make good, sense? I think that's a good term for that. But how do we create this pressure differential? Well, there are a number of different ways to get this done. For example, differential valves like the o OLDR, I always want to say older. That's what people say when they see me, they say older. You know? um, sometimes. Now, like the OLDR in the diagram, they maintain a differential pressure between the defrost header and the liquid header. This that's exactly what they're designed to do. This differential pressure provides a way for the re reverse flow of refrigerant to actually occur. Let's look at that flow path again. And you would have flow right along here, go through the evaporator. Right. We have to think in reverse flow that in for, yeah. for this for this purpose, for right. thinking about defrost. And then and then that expansion valve is probably not going to readily allow flow backwards. And that's why nope. we've got this check valve plumbed in around it. That's and correct. that's why we got this check valve plumbed in around this solenoid valve. Mm -hmm. Now, John, what's the deal with these arrows? Some people might say that's incorrect. Well, those, are, those arrows are just illustrating the direction of the flow uh, in this case during defrost. Got it. Got it. And that's simply what that means. Here's an overview of a few examples of different defrost differential valves from the brass bodied OLDR 16 to the refrigerating specialties A8. The traditional Sporlin defrost differential valves include 
painted steel valve bodies like you see here, here in the OLDR20 and the DDR20 that you see over here. Now we do plan a future webinar that'll cover the operating characteristics of these refrigerating specialties product lines. Uh, but while the various OLDRs are designed to maintain a differential pressure between the receiver and the liquid header, the DDR over here is a little different. It functions as a discharge differential pressure regulating valve. Oh, I say that fast three times. I don't think I can. You guessed it. It's installed in the discharge line before the condenser. And it simply works to maintain an appropriate pressure differential to facilitate reverse flow of hot gas. It maintains the defrost header at a pressure higher than receiver pressure and reverse flow can take place. Correct. Well, here's more on troubleshooting. I guess we're expecting things to go wrong. Uh, the case does not defrost or defrost completely. And we said that's a problem if it happens. That is a problem. So what are some more things that can happen? Well, okay. well, there's probably a few more things that can happen with with gas defrost. Um, so the um, the hot gas solenoid coil could have failed. That's one option. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Suction stop valve not closing. Okay. Um, that would basically be just allowing the defrost gas to be drawn right into the suction header instead. Um, and then another possibility is that the defrost differential may be set a little bit too low. You simply don't have adequate flow because of that low differential. You simply don't have adequate flow through the evaporators from the different from the defrost header. Makes sense. Well, you know that all this is telling me setting up some type of gas defrost is a little tricky. Can be. It, it can be. Um, Basically, I think each individual gas system um, needs to definitely needs to have there's there's always a starting point uh, set points for everything, but each system probably needs to be tuned somewhat in the field. Makes uh, I sense. Don't, I don't think you can uh, assume that you're going to just set everything to the recommended values and have a have a truly uh, optimized system every time with gas. Uh, Got it. it. It takes a little bit of tuning and and uh, and setting for each individual. Um, for each individual system. Makes sense. Well, here's that cool gas defrost. Mm -hmm. And I know there's a reason why it's called that. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Right. But would you see a cool gas defrost on a low temp, a low temp system, John? Absolutely. That's where it would be used. Okay. And so I've heard that the process of that helps reduce thermal shock on the evaporator coil. That's true. What's thermal shock? Well, uh, a quick temperature change from a very you know, from a very low temperature that was the coil's normally operating at to a very high temperature, as you're going to see if you hit it with discharge gas through a hot gas defrost. Gotcha. So the the cool gas causes the ice or that frost to turn loose and fall off the evaporator. Mm -hmm. Sort of like a harvest cycle almost. It is a little bit like you know the the idea behind hot gas defrost is you're going to to just absolutely melt the frost right off the evaporator. And collect it. And just collect it as condensate. Yeah. Um, and, you, and you don't want to drink that, right? Uh, yeah. Probably not. Probably not. I, we I don't have to put that. a warning sign on it. Do not drink the condensate. No, 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 no. Not for me anyway. Right. Not for me anyway. Um, but the cool gas cycle is intended to just cause the ice to turn loose and then fall off uh, still in ice form. Okay. But now I, I've heard that it sometimes needs in a little bit of electrical assistance to get it to thaw and go on down the drain. Is that right? That's correct. How does that yeah. work? So you would have a, uh, a drain pan heater. So you still are, still are going to use a little bit of electric heat, even with a cool gas system. So it's not to get it off the evaporator coil, but it's to help get it down the drain. Right. You've got to get it liquid enough to get it down the drain. Uh, so it has to be thawed uh, down the day, down the drain. And then, because otherwise you will uh, cause a big iceberg in your drain pan. And that's not good. That's not good. And, and I've heard that it doesn't warm the product up as much compared to other methods. That's true. And it, is, it is a very low, imp, it's a very low impact of the product. Which is good. Mm -hmm. And then, and then you won't have the frost occur on the product like you might with other, other techniques. And that's probably a big deal for the marketing it aspect of it selling is. the product. You, uh, you introduce less uh, overall heat to the case. You produce less uh, relatively warm, humid air which uh, in a low temp case is going to probably cause that frost buildup 
that you know that minor frost build up to see on the product and yeah. uh, merchandisers don't like that understandably so makes so so cool gas defrost is very similar to so-called hot gas defrost except the refrigerant is pulled from the top of the receiver correct and the cool gas is going to be maybe slightly superheated but to saturate it right right however it's very slightly superheated. but it's significantly lower temperature as compared to traditional hot gas defrost methods yes correct? very correct. very much lower than that again less thermal shock to the evaporator uh without drastically extending defrost times that all right. sounds good now, check valves are typically piped around the TEV and solenoid valve for reverse flow defrost to reduce pressure drop in the lines. And here you can really see this in good detail. We've got the defrost header. We see the defrost line being routed through a solenoid that would need to open for the process to take place. Hot gas goes through the evaporator. Then here's one of those side connection style distributors. Yep. Hot gas would enter it and flow around the thermostatic expansion valve by means of this check valve assembly. And then we've right. got an external check valve that works in conjunction with this solenoid valve to route it back to the liquid header. Mm -hmm. Now in this system here, we've got some type of nice a split valve. That would be a three-way solenoid valve. Three-way solenoid valve. But the same kind of thing happens with the defrost mechanism taking place in the evaporator, side connection style distributor, distributor, check valve around the expansion valve. But here, we don't show an external check around this solenoid valve. That would be because that's a solenoid valve with an internal check. Oh, come on. We make things, are, there are things like that? Well, Indeed he, there are. Well, here it is. Uh, this, this, this type of solenoid valve incorporates the check valve into the design. The solenoid valve would open normally during refrigeration mode, and for defrost, the valve must be energized to lift the plunger. Uh, refrigerant flow would then lift the ball check and cause the floating disc to fully open. Kind of a neat little trick. Correct. So it's a, it's a solenoid valve that can close in normal refrigeration mode when it needs to, but still open for reverse flow. And, and it's got a ball check built into mm -hmm. it, which right there, right comes up the off that opening there, which mm -hmm. uh, would the, the defrost flow have enough oomph to push that away? Is that what the idea yeah, is? Yeah, it takes a very, very small differential. Uh, it only takes probably a, a couple of PSI, if even that, to uh, unseat that little check ball there. That makes sense. Not much at all. Let's, let's kind of just try to capture these different techniques and say, summarize things a little mm -hmm. bit. So off time defrost, makes the most sense for medium temp systems. Indeed, you usually have plenty of, uh, plenty of defrost heat, if you will, available there just through, uh, just through uh, air infiltration that's gonna normally happen with the case with the fans on. And if, you, and, if the, and if the unit or the case has been designed to accommodate it, it just simply works. It does. It's actually about the most reliable system you can have. But if you get to low temp systems, you're going to need something like hot gas or the cool gas. They're good choices there. Yes. And off, off time is not going to do the trick for a low temp case for a number of reasons, some of which we've already talked about, but uh, it's just inadequate for, for a low temp case. But if you had tried to use off time, it's likely not reliable enough in applications to get the job done if that saturated suction temperature gets low. Correct. A lot of folks like gas defrost methods. If the rack is large enough to supply the hot gas, this method really works. It does. Uh, it can be a little tricky to set up mm -hmm. and there can be some problems along the way, but it works. It works. It's pretty doggone good. Yep. However, electric defrost, as we've said, is simple, reliable, effective for low temp systems. Mm -hmm. And with the advent of rules and regulations, similar to things like AWEF that we're seeing come into play, Hot gas may not always be a viable answer in every application. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably going to thwart some of our sales of OLDR product line too. Yeah, and, it uh, could do that. See how that yeah, goes? It could do that. But I think we're seeing more and more electric defrost systems all the time. Yeah. Does that make sense? I believe so. John, do we have any questions that we ought to try to answer at this point? You know, we do. Um, uh, one, can you answer them? Because I don't know if I can. I think I can. Answer. Okay, you go I for it. I think I can answer this one. Um, what determines the amount of defrost differential pressure required? 
Um, that should actually be determined uh, and published by the equipment manufacturer. There should be a recommendation for that for, for a given system. So uh, if, you, if you don't have that, um, I think we have some guidelines on that in our bulletin. Yeah. What, what would be considered normal settings for that? Yeah. And you can find any of those bulletins at, you know, www.sporland.com and mm -hmm. download them for free. I think what we'll do at a future time, we'll, do, we'll, we'll go in and delve further into the subject of defrost differential valves when we get into yep. the FlowCon product I think that line. That would be a good idea. We do have a couple other questions here, but I think that these are questions we may not really have time okay. well, to deal with. I'll say this, <clears throat> any questions that we don't answer now, we'll go back, we'll give the, we'll give the submitter a personal response, mm -hmm. and then we'll eventually post these. This yes. time has really gone by fast. You got, John, you got anything else we ought to try to deal with right now? Um, not right now. Okay, well, we're wrapping this up. Um, again, this has been recorded. You can go back and listen to it over and over, either on YouTube, which is a good place to go because it's got all the other ones out there. And I think it'll hit there and just, a, if not tomorrow, by certainly by Monday, but it might even so. be tomorrow. And here it is again. We're here to assist you with your air conditioning and refrigeration flow control needs. You can call the general number, our headquarters number, 636-239-1111. You can get a hold of tech support. We've got trained professionals, humans that have experience in this industry, and they will help you. 636-392-3906. Or you can always send an email to SVD tech support at parker.com. And of course, we're here 24-7. Notice I didn't say what I wasn't supposed to say. Here comes the commercial. Sporland.com for product literature, virtual engineer. That's our Product selection program. John, you had something to do with putting that together, if I recall. I may have. I may have. You can review an encore performance of this webinar on Facebook or YouTube. And we've talked about that probably enough at this point. Here's that shameless promotion for the next webinar. April 22nd, we're back to the old schedule of one webinar per month. And I certainly hope you'll join us then. This concludes our webinar for today. Thanks for being here with us. We hope you enjoyed it. We hope you learned a little something and please join us next time.